Now our passage this evening is Titus chapter 2 and we're going to read the passage together. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behaviour as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not, per not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak, and exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. And we know that God blesses the reading of his word, and we do we look to him for his help as we consider it together this evening. Now it's, it's always good to be... Uh, asked to open the Word of God and to teach the Scriptures, but I was particularly pleased to be given the opportunity to teach one of the chapters of this lovely epistle. It's a short epistle, uh, and superficially it's, it's a simple epistle, and yet the more time I spend in Titus, the more I study Titus, the more I appreciate something of the, the beauty of its structure, as well as the weight and the force and the relevance of its teaching. It is, of course, we know, along with the first and second epistle to Timothy, it's one of the pastoral epistles. And if there are young believers connected to the call this evening who haven't made it their business to get to grips with these three epistles, if I could uh, achieve nothing else this evening, I would like to encourage you and to urge you to spend time in these three epistles to two young men, because they are so practical and so very relevant to us and to the circumstances that we find ourselves in. It's always a dangerous thing to, to talk about the, the key verse of any epistle, because generally speaking, well, all the verses are, are key to the understanding of any epistle. But maybe uh, we're on slightly safer ground uh, in not having even just a key verse, but a key expression that right at the beginning of the epistle to Titus opens up the epistle for us. And it's the little expression that we have at the end of the first verse of chapter 1, where the apostle speaks of the truth which is after godliness, or the truth which is according to godliness. And one of the wonderful things about this epistle is, and about the pastoral epistles indeed, in fact about every epistle really, is, is the fact that it emphasizes for us that doctrine and practice are not two separate things. Sometimes we can keep them, as it were, at arm's length from each other, and we can differentiate between teaching uh, or between scriptures that are doctrinal uh, and teaching or scriptures that are practical. And that's a, that's a false dichotomy. That's a, a misleading difference to make. And one of the great lessons that we learn as we make our way through this epistle is that all doctrine is practical and that all practice must be founded in doctrine. And really, the, the three uh, chapters of the epistle are, are all structured in a way that makes that very clear. E each, each one of the ch those chapters uh, is divided by uh, the, the expression for. 
and hen, each chapter, if you like, hinges on the expression for, so that in each of these three chapters, we have a, the first section, which is not always the first half, we have an initial section which gives us divine requirements. But when we get to this hinge point, when we get to this four, we discover that there's nothing arbitrary about these requirements, and we're given the reason that lie behind those requirements. So, for example, in chapter one, we have uh, the importance of, of standards uh, regarding elders brought before us. And in verse 10, we're told why it is so important that an elder is marked by the character and the caliber that is brought before us. And we're told for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. And the verses that follow give us the reason for the requirements in the first section. We'll be looking, uh, and we need to get to grips with our chapter very quickly, but we will be looking at some very practical requirements uh, that occupy the first 10 verses of this chapter. And you say, why is that important? Why does it matter how old men, or uh, sorry, aged men and aged women, and young men and young women, why does it matter how we live? Well, in verse 11, we get the four, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And we come into chapter three. And again, we have requirements brought before us uh, in the first two verses of the chapter. And we come to verse three. Why, why does this matter? And he says four. And we are pointed back to that time in our own experience when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards men appeared. And we appreciated that and we were saved. So that right through the epistle, the emphasis is on truth and on godliness. And we need to be careful not to disunite or to disassociate what is brought together in the epistle. There are three chapters to the epistle. And it has often been said, and I think it's a, it's a very adequate uh, division of, of the epistle, that in chapter one, we have doctrine and duty in the church. I think as John Stott has conduct and creed, which is a, a slightly uh, less usual choice of words, but it'll do quite well as well. But doctrine and duty in relation to the church. In chapter two, where we are this evening, we have doctrine and duty in relation to the home. And in chapter three, it's in relation to the wider society. It is doctrine and duty in relation, if you like, to the state. Of course, Paul gives us a, a division of the epistle, which is, uh, is, is not uh, threefold. He tells Titus that he left him in, in Crete to do two things, that they should have set in order the things that are wanting, and secondly, ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. And then he takes those up in reverse order. And so the balance of chapter one has to do with the ordaining of elders. And when we get into chapter two and three, we're dealing with the setting in order the things that are wanting. But although that gives us a twofold division, we discover that uh, the, the, a threefold division is really stamped on the, on the pages of this epistle. Each chapter will have a doctrinal section, as we've seen. Each chapter will refer to God our Savior. Each chapter will unfold truth relative to God our Savior that looks back and that looks forward as well. And these are things that, that we could explore if we had a bit more time. But my subject is chapter two, and there's a lot in chapter two, and we need to get to that really post haste. And we notice that the chapter begins with a but. In fact, it begins with a but thou. And this is an interesting phrase to, to trace through the pastoral epistles, and it's very characteristic of these epistles. What we'll find is this, that the, the apostle, he, he will speak about the big picture. He, he will speak to Titus, he will speak to Timothy about the context in which they must labor for God. And very often the picture that he will paint will not be a bright or a cheerful picture. And then the point will come. And it's as though the, 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 the searchlight focuses right in on the individual. And their eyes are turned away from the wider context. And they are reminded now, no matter what the context, no matter what the uh, wider departure, no matter what the uh, need of society around about, you as an individual have responsibilities. And here at the beginning of chapter two, the focus comes right in up on Titus. Uh, and he has been speaking about these, uh, these Cretans. He's been speaking about uh, the, their negative characteristics. And he now says, Titus, forget about them. Just leave them to one side. It's getting personal. This is what you have to do. 
It's good, you know, when we hear the word of God like that. And I was praying earlier on that there would be some listening uh, to the Zoom meeting this evening. And as they would hear this chapter open, that you would appreciate that this is not just what God says to the believers. Not what, just what God says to those who are gathered to the meeting, but that you would feel the weight, the force of the but thou. And whether you're an older brother or an older sister, or a younger brother or a younger sister, whether you're a servant, that you would appreciate that this is what God says to you individually. It's easy for us to get distracted by the context, whether it's the, the wider context of the world or, or the context of those we're in fellowship with or our friends or whatever it might be. There's a but thou that separates us from all of that. Uh, and Paul will speak directly and pointedly to Titus. And he speaks to him about the things that he's to teach in contrast to the, the false teaching that is, is spreading through the Cretan society. And he says, you're to speak the things which become the things which are fitting to sound doctrine. Now, this is a, a word, again, that's characteristic of these pastoral epistles, this idea of sound doctrine. It's a word that will be translated in First Timothy as, as wholesome, wholesome words. And it's a lovely concept. It has the idea of that which is promoting of health. It's the word that is used of those, some of those in the Gospels. Luke will use it of those who, were, who, who had sickness, who had disability. They encountered the Lord Jesus Christ and they were made whole. That's just the, what we have here. This is healthy speech. This is wholesome speech. And the point is often made that uh, this is related to the, the word from which we get our word hygiene, but really that doesn't go far enough. Yeah, right enough it was to be free from contamination, but that sells the meaning of this word short. It's not just a negative freedom from contamination, it's a positive promotion of that which is helpful. And he's going to give us things which become sound doctrine. So here is the standard of behavior that is appropriate to that is becoming to sound doctrine and he does so in this fourfold division we leave the servants to to one side just for a second he, he does so first of all in a fourfold division aged men aged women young men young women now even if i could see you which i can't i wouldn't dream of telling you which of those categories you fall into but i know this that you do fall into one of them whether it is that you are an older brother or sister or a younger brother or sister, you can find instructions, you can find directions for you in this passage. And I was, it did just appeal to me as, as I was thinking of this during the week, the fact that God's people are addressed by the apostles so comprehensively. One of the very simple things, and yet the vitally important things that we can learn from that is simply this, that, that everybody matters, that everybody is important. You know, one of the, one of the real sadnesses of, of seeing the, the COVID-19 situation unfold here in Ireland and in other countries as well has been that it has made us appreciate just how badly old people are often treated. And too often they are forgotten, too often they are sidelined. And it should never be like that in the things of God because whether you're older or younger, my brother, my sister, you have a part to play. And if we allow a disconnect between the generations, we are the losers. That becomes very clear as we go through these verses that that contact between the generations, that the older generation has a responsibility for a younger generation and a younger generation has a responsibility to an older generation. And I do think we need to be very careful as the people of God about anything which might even for the best of, with the best of intentions that might tend to divide between the generations. Because we need each other, brethren and sisters. Whether we're older, whether we're younger, whether we're male, whether we're female, all have a part to play. And all have a responsibility to manifest those things which become sound doctrine. So we have the age men. And they are to be sober. And this really is a word that means to be free from wine. And I did appreciate what uh, our brother Arbuthnot had to say in his session in relation to the elders in chapter one. 
And of course, we cannot say that Scripture gives a blanket prohibition to the drinking of wine. But the tenor of passages like this makes it clear that really, alcohol should play no part, no role in the life of the believer. It is interesting, I think, that it is in relation to the older men and to the older women that the prohibition is brought in. Sometimes we get the idea, don't we, that, that the temptation to, towards social drinking is something that is the province exclusively of the young. And of course, it is a pressure that, that we've all had to face. And it's been a, it's a very sad reflection, certainly again, I can only speak for Ireland, on the state of Irish society that all the way through the summer, as, as the situation with COVID has unfolded, the constant refrain has been, get the pubs open, get the pubs open. And it seems to be that there are two sorts of people. Uh, there are people who think that uh, getting the pubs open is as important as having the schools open, and people who think it's more important. Now, we've been called to be separate from all of that. And that sort of behavior has, has no place in the life of the Christian. And it could just be that for those who are older, there is a whole, there is a whole status thing associated with the bottle of wine on the dinner table. And it seems so very attractive and so very appealing. The aged men are instructed to be sober and the aged women are instructed that they're not to be given to much wine. They're to be grave. This is, a, this is an interesting word. Really, it has the idea of being the sort of person that people look up to. Now, you can see why the translators didn't translate it like that, because that's a rather cumbersome way of putting it. But that's just what the word means. It also means august, which means that as well, though I suspect it's a word we don't use quite so often. And it's speaking about a, a dignity of behavior that is to mark those, not, not a dourness. You know, there is, it is a mistake to confuse a, a sour face with spirituality. But this is a, this is a gravity that is to mark the age men. They're to be temperate. Now, we need to move quickly through these verses, but I do just want to stop a little on this word. Again, this is, a, this is a key word, not only of this epistle, but of the pastoral epistles as a whole. Just uh, cast your eye down the passage. You'll see that the, the aged men, they are to be temperate. At the beginning of verse 4, the, the older sisters, they are to teach the young women to be sober. Uh, verse 5, the young women are to be discreet. Verse uh, 6, the young men are to be sober-minded. And these are all the related forms of the same word. And it's a word that runs right through the pastoral epistles. And it's a word that really means to, to be sensible. It means to be sound in your thinking, not to be ruled by your impulses, not to be ruled by your desires and just moved around by, by the whims of what you might desire at a particular time. It's a word that means to think, to use your mind, to be self-controlled. And all these meanings are contained in it. And for every class of believer, we have brought before us here the importance of self-control. They are to be sound, and that soundness is a threefold soundness in faith, in charity, in patience. I take it this is their own faith, it's not necessarily speaking about their grasp of the body of doctrine. I think the fact that it accompanies here with love and with patience makes that clear. And if I might just leap on my hobby horse for one fleeting second, I would point out that the, the definite article is here. It's the faith, even though, again, I would suggest the context makes it clear that it's talking about the individual's subjective faith. So when somebody tells you, as they sometimes will, that the faith uh, in chapter one, at the beginning of the chapter, that that cannot be objective because it hasn't got the definite article. You just nod and smile and take that with a pinch of salt. As I say, hobby horse, brief gallop, we'll put it back in the stable now. So they are to be marked then by the soundness, again that word, in faith and in charity and in patience. You know, it's amazing with what, that, what just a few brief words in this verse with what economy the apostle can sketch out just the, the profile of a Christian gentleman. And this is what the aged men are to be. But mind you, there's not much point waking up. I don't know at what point you become an aged man. And even though I'm safely ensconced here at the end of a Zoom call, I'm not going to speculate. But I know this, there's no point waking up at 50 or 60 or 70 or whatever it might be and saying, I want to, I want to be a, an aged man with this character. 
You have to lock in the trajectory while you're young. And this is the, the trajectory that all of us should be on. Sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The aged women, he says, likewise. And then he has a, a most lovely expression. He says that they be in behavior, really the idea is demeanor, it's, it's what is inward being outwardly manifest in behavior as becometh holiness. And really the idea of that expression is that they should be marked by priestly character. So here are aged women. And what a lovely thing it is that older sisters can be marked by a, a priestly character, by being in behavior as becometh holiness. And if that is to mark them, then there is uh, two things that, that must not be seen in them. They're not to be false accusers. They're not to be slanderers. They're not to be troublemakers. They're to be controlled in their speech. And again, they're not to be given to much wine. And so there are things that will, that will be incompatible, not only with sound doctrine as we have it in the first verse, but they will be incompatible as well with the manifestation of a priestly character with behavior as becometh holiness. And they are to be teachers of good things, or perhaps the sense is that they are to be good teachers. And we come to verse 4. I don't know about you, but there are some verses in the Bible that I feel sorry for. And the reason that I feel sorry for them is that people that have a particular agenda take them and twist them and stretch them. I think that the biblical world might be rest them to make them talk about things that they were never intended to speak about. And this verse does not give us a mandate or a license for such unscriptural activities as women's conferences or, or as women's meetings. The public teaching of sis by sisters is not at all envisaged in this verse. And the problem is, or one of the problems at least is, that when we seek to shoehorn that into the, the verse. And when we try to, to rest the verse to make it mean that, we tend to lose sight of what it's actually saying. And what it's actually saying is really, really important. Now, I've said that this, this, uh, this verse does not envisage public teaching. And maybe it would be good just to provide some evidence rather than just a bold assertion that that is the case. And I think we can provide that evidence on two levels. First of all, the, the manner of the teaching, and secondly, the matter of the teaching. Now you look at the, the beginning of verse four, you see that, that, that uh, whole first expression that they may teach the young women to be sober, that really translates a, a single verb. And it's a verb that, uh, the, the sense of it is, can, can vary a little bit just depending on, on how strongly you apply it. I mean, there's a perfect translation that would work in Ireland. Uh, we would say, tell them to cop on. But I have conducted some researches and apparently this is unknown in, in, in all sorts of places. But that's the idea. It's a call, it's a forceful call to right thinking. It's a forceful call to see things as they really are. It's a forceful call to, to value things correctly. But it is forceful. One of the commentators says that it has a, a slap in the face sort of quality. And this is the only occasion in your New Testament where this word is used. It's never used of, of, of in the other occasions that speak of teaching that uh, envisage, that talk about public teaching. And so it indicates to us that this is something that is different in character from that. But look at the not just the manner of the teaching, look at the matter of the teaching. Seven things are included in this business of, of teaching young women to be sober. They're to love their husbands. They're to love their children. They're to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. And these are not, I would suggest to you, the sort of things that are best taught in a public setting. These are not the sort of things, if, if I can use the, the jargon of my trade, that are best taught one to many. These are the things that are taught one to one as an older sister with experience and the authority that it brings. Teach those who are younger these practical things 
relating to godly conduct in the home. And they are to teach them, to instruct them in these areas. But that means that the younger sisters have to be willing to, to be instructed. And so there's a responsibility on both generations. And this brings us back again. One of the things I love about the, the pastoral epistles is that we have that, that mentorship relationship between Paul and Timothy, between Paul and Titus. We'd love to have more Timothys. We'd love to have more Tituses. Maybe part of the re re answer is to have more Pauls. And here again, we have this, and again, it's, it's terrible jargon, but we have this intergenerational relationship of an older generation willing to teach and a younger generation willing to be taught. Now, having said that this is not material for public teaching, perhaps it behooves me to pass relatively lightly over, over these, these seven things. Just to note again that they are practical things, that they include this idea of, of, of sobriety at the beginning of verse 5, the, the discreteness, that they include purity that they identify the home as the, the main area of the sister's responsibility. They are to be keepers at home. I don't think that necessarily means that a sister will never work outside the home. But the priority will be to keep the home. A, a sister could stay at home and not be a keeper of the home. A sister could go out to work and fully uh, discharge her duty as a keeper of the home. And I think all we can do is say what scripture says, that younger sisters are expected to be keepers at home. They're to be good. They're to be obedient to their own husbands. And the motive is this, that the word of God be not evil spoken of. You know, that's a, that's a, a high goal. And it, I think, I think the, its lofty nature becomes clearer when we think about the inverse. Imagine younger sister. Conducting yourself in such a way that, living your life in such a way that the word of God would be evil spoken of. The, the idea would, would horrify us. And yet it can happen. Yet it does happen. And we should seek, to all of us should seek, to order our lives in such a way that the word of God be not blasphemed. You see, there is a, an awareness right through this chapter of a society that's looking on, a society that's watching, and that's ready to criticize. And so we need to be careful in the quality of our behavior. Young men, he says, exhort to be sober-minded. Again, it's our, our, our sober word. And you think the young men are getting off very easily, aren't they? The, 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 the sisters, the, the poor younger sisters have this, this big long list. But I think Titus is, is, is brought before us in, in, in verse 7 as, as a model for these young men. So what is said of Titus in, in verse 7 and 8 should be true of, of all young men. And you will notice, and very important it is, that when Paul speaks to Titus and when he speaks of Titus, the first thing that he addresses is his conduct. He's to be a pattern of good works. So before ever he will speak to Titus about his teaching, he speaks to him about the caliber and the quality of his life. You remember Ezra. His desire was to know and to do and to teach. And that is still the divinely sanctioned order for those who will open the word of God. He's to be a pattern of good works. So in the idea of the pattern, this is what the young men were to emulate. And then in his teaching, he was to be marked by uncorruptness. There was to be a freedom from defilement in his teaching. What he was teaching had to be right. There was to be gravity in his teaching. And this relates back to the, the our august word in, in verse 2. There was to be that weight with his teaching. It wasn't an activity to be uh, undertaken in a frivolous or a slovenly way. He wasn't to, to have his hands in his pockets. He wasn't to be chewing gum as he spoke. There was a, a gravity associated with his, with his teaching. And there was sincerity. So the teaching was not only to be grave, but it was to be genuine as well. And it was to be sound speech. There's our word again. These wholesome, health-giving words that cannot be condemned. So that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say to you. You see, again, there is this sense that there are those who would love to condemn. There are those who would love to undermine and to deride and to deny the doctrine that is taught. And mind you, anyone who, who seeks to teach the saints will discover that, that that is still the case. 
that to teach is to open yourself up to attention and to criticism. And how good it is when our teaching and our life are such that those who are of the contrary part find themselves without any evil thing to say of you. And so we have this fourfold division and we could say more about that but this is one of those passages that has the dense section at the end and I'll be very upset if we don't leave sort of semi-reasonable time to deal with it. But before we leave this practical section we have the servants except they're not servants they're slaves. Uh, it may well be that I think the fact that masters aren't addressed here probably suggests that in the in the assemblies in Crete there were more slaves than there were masters. These were people at the very, very bottom of the ladder. These were people whose lives were not their own. They're, these were people who, who were looked down upon. And how precious it is that he, as he speaks to them, and as he ex exhorts them to be obedient to their own masters, to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, all good faithfulness, that he says to them, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour in all things. You're listening to this, most of you, on, on some sort of computational device, and even though I suppose you're not really supposed to encourage your audience to, to Google things, take a few minutes after you finish the meeting this evening and, and Google George Herbert, the elixir. Uh, and it is from that lovely poem by George Herbert that we have these words, All may of thee partake, nothing can be so mean, which with his tincture for thy sake will not go bright and clean. A servant with this clause makes drudgery divine. Who sweeps a room as for thy laws makes that and the action fine. Here are people at the very, very bottom of, a, of the social ladder. And Paul says, now you tell them that they discharge their duties in such a way that they will adorn, beautify the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Mind you, that's still relevant for us. For all of us, our employment is, is such a large part of our lives. And in the world round about us, we have people who, who, who treat their job as something that didn't matter at all. And you have other people who treat their employment as though it were the only thing that mattered. Now, as believers, we cannot fall into either of those camps. We know that it's not the only thing that matters. We know that it's not the main thing. And yet, as we are conscious that what we do, we do unto the Lord. And as we seek to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things, then we must feel the responsibility not to purloin, not to answer again, but to show all good fidelity to our masters. And mind you, we do need to be careful that we don't look down on others who have what we might regard as, as more humble forms of employment. Social climbing is, is never a tasteful thing, and it's particularly dis distasteful amongst the Lord's people. Snobbery has no place, because there is no honest job so humble, but that whoever has it is not able to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. What a dignity this gave to these slaves. Their lives must have seen, seemed unpleasant in so many ways. The apostle says, now it matters. It's not, it's not beneath attention. It's not beneath importance. It really matters because you have the opportunity of adorning the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. So right through the verses of this chapter, we discover how we ought to live. So that in a, a negative sense, the word of God be not blasphemed. That's good. But so that we adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. That's good. So that our lives are marked by what we have described in verse number one as the things which become sound doctrine. Why does it matter, Paul? Well, the Apostle Paul is a good teacher. He's not going to do what we sometimes do. Sometimes we teach requirements without the reasons for them. That's a very dangerous course of action. We should always teach the requirements of God's word, but we should make sure that we teach to the reasons that God's word gives for those requirements. You say, why does it matter that we, we live like this? Well, here in verse 11, we have this, this hinge word for the chapter. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, 
righteously and godly in this present world. This is one of Paul's big, long sentences from verse uh, 11 down to the end of verse 14. And so we need to, to step our way through it carefully. First of all, we have this lovely expression in verse 11. The grace of God, really perhaps it should be rendered, the grace of God hath appeared, bringing salvation to all. What a, a lovely description this is. You see, this, this, is, a, this is a word that, that was used in, uh, this, this appearing word was often used in, 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 in the society of the time to speak about imperial appearances and, and imperial visitations. But here Paul says there's something far greater and far grander than that altogether has appeared. The grace of God has appeared. And it has brought salvation within reach of all. I, I take it that in this idea of the grace of God appearing, we have really brought before us the whole of, of the first coming of Christ. And the expression would embrace everything from, from Bethlehem right through to, to Calvary and to the empty tomb. The whole of what we speak of as the first advent of Christ is embraced here. It is the grace of God appearing. And says Paul, it brings salvation to all. Not that all will be saved, but that there's salvation for all. Uh, and again, this is, a, this is a theme of the pastoral epistles. It is the pastoral epistles that will remind us that God, our Savior, will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And thank God for the, the expanse of the provision. It, it was, whether it was old or young, whether it was masters or servants, whether it was Jew or whether it was Gentile, says the apostle, the grace of God hath appeared and it brings salvation to all. But then he says that grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly righteously and godly in this present age this word teaching is interesting this is the this is the word that was used for 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 the instruction that would enable someone to be a citizen and that's very telling and i want you just to bear with me a second because i want to i want to step back for a second into chapter one to explain what i think is going on in this verse You'll remember that in chapter 1, verse 12, we have this, and Paul is quoting, he's not speaking himself, he, he quotes one of their own poets. We're told that the Cretans are liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. Now that, um, the fact that it is a Cretan who says that Cretans are liars has been described as a paradox, you know, do you believe a, a man who tells you he's always lying? But in actual fact, that, that paradox is perhaps something that we've projected back because in uh, contemporary culture, when people spoke about the Cretans as liars, they weren't so much speaking generally as in you should never believe what a Cretan says, but they were speaking about the fact that the Cretans had a form of, of religion that was different from the rest of Rome. And so when we're thinking about the, the Cretans as liars, we're thinking specifically about people who have what, even by the standards of Rome, was a false religion. So we're thinking about people who are not right as far as their relationship with God is concerned. Then they're described as evil beasts. And again, it was a contemporary writer who said that the island of Crete was remarkable because it had very few vicious wild animals. But he added, it doesn't need them because the men make up for it. I speak to you, of course, from an island that is remarkable for its freedom from vicious wild animals. And I won't take that thought any further. So not only were these Cretans wrong as far as their relationship to God was concerned, but they were, they were wrong in their relationship to each other. They were evil beasts. There was that ferocity in their interpersonal relationships. And then he says, and it's a wonderful expression, isn't it? They're slow bellies. So they didn't have this self-control that, that the apostle speaks so much about in the chapter. So they were wrong in, in relation to their self-control. So that's what, that's what Cretan society is like. Paul says, he's very realistic. He says to Titus, this Titus is what you're up against. Now he says, in, in our verse here in chapter 2, he says, the grace of God has appeared. The grace of God is teaching us how to be citizens. And he says, those Cretan believers, they used to be bellies, slow bellies. He said, they're to live soberly, they're to be right in relation to their self-control. He says, those Cretans, they used to be evil beasts. Now they're to live righteously in their relationships with each other. He says, those Cretans, they were, they were wrong 
in their relationship to God. They were liars in that religious sense. And he says, now you're to live godly. You see what he's done? He's taken that sad, that solemn, that appalling description of Cretan society and quite literally he has turned it upside down and inside out. And he says, the grace of God teaches us that we're to be just the exact opposite of the society in which we live. This is being countercultural. It's not, it's not putting a, a, a needle through your nose and, and dressing in strange clothes. It's living soberly and righteously and godly. And that's why he adds at the end of the verse this expression, in this present world, in this present age. So it's not just to live unlike the men of Crete. Well, it's to live the exact opposite, the inverse and the opposite of the norms and the expectations of our own society. Our world is still full of liars, evil beasts and slow bellies. Nonetheless, the grace of God, it still instructs us how we should live as citizens. And we should live soberly. And we should live righteously. And we should live godly in this present age. But of course, we're not just taken up, not just preoccupied with this present age, because we are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This looking for word, this is the, this is, you remember uh, Anna, uh, that, that lovely character, uh, and, and when the Savior was brought into the temple and, and when she saw him, she went, she spoke of him to all them that looked for redemption in Israel. It's a word that was used as well of Simeon. Here were individuals and they were, they were taken up with, they were not just in a kind of a detached academic way as in this is going to happen someday, but earnestly, eagerly, urgently, they were looking for the first coming of the Savior. You and I are expected to be looking just as earnestly, eagerly, and urgently. And my brother, my sister, if we're not doing it now, in the midst of all the events of, of this most eventful of years, when the infrastructure of, of Antichrist seems to be being erected around us, and when the fragility of everything that seems solid is written large across the front pages of our newspapers day after day. Surely, surely, brethren and sisters, we should be saying, we can almost hear his footfall on the, presence of the, on the threshold of the door. We don't look for signs. But we should be looking eagerly for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't notice... I don't know if you noticed, but by the time I got to the end of that verse, I was, when I was reading it, I got, had got rather out of breath because I very uh, purposefully and deliberately didn't want to pause on the way through and for reasons that will be familiar to many of you. You see, this is one of those verses that <clears throat> a Bible reading would, would have to sort of grind to a halt on, wouldn't it? And, 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 it so, and so to a degree it should. And we would find material to discuss in, in both halves of this verse. And the first thing we would have to think about would relate to the first half. What, when it speaks about that blessed hope and the glorious appearing, is it speaking about one event or two? And what event or events is it speaking about? Now, you will have heard it taught, as have I, that the verse is presenting us with two events. And there will be some who will have suggested that the blessed hope is a description of the rapture and who will have suggested that the glorious appearing refers to the, the manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the suggestion will be that this can be separated into two different events. I do not think that's the case. Grammatically, it is far more likely that, that one event is spoken of. But beyond the grammatical problem, there's a theological problem with that. Because yes, the rapture is the hope of the church. But the manifestation of Christ is every, uh, much, every bit as much a hope of the church. And there has historically and, uh, been a tendency to, to emphasize the rapture so that we can often lose sight of the fact not only that Christ is coming to the air for us, thank God he is, but my brother, my sister, he's coming again to the earth. 
to set up his kingdom. We shouldn't be able to open a newspaper without saying, even so, come Lord Jesus. When we think of this world and, and all of its need and all of its injustice and all of its willful ignorance of God, and there's coming a day when he's going to come and he will reign. And justice will flow down like the waters. The knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And there'll be justice and there'll be equity. And says the scriptures, he'll come down like rain upon the moon grass. And that's your hope and mine. Because we're going to reign with him. And so our blessed hope is not just the rapture. But our blessed hope embraces as well the manifestation. So I think it's one event that we have referred to here. But you still want to know which event. Well, I don't think we necessarily have to choose. Because in verse 11, we have the first advent of Christ just brought together, embraced under this, this one expression. The grace of God hath appeared. And we've said already, and at least the two brethren that I can see here were nodding, we've said already that this takes us from Bethlehem and all the way through the events of the life of the Lord Jesus and on to Calvary and on to the empty tomb. And it's all embraced. I want to suggest to you that really we can take uh, verse 13 to refer just as broadly to, to his second coming in, in both of its stages. Rapture and manifestation. But however we read it, please, please, please don't exclude the manifestation from it because we should be looking not just for for him but for his appearing for his manifestation but then there's the second half of the verse of the great god and our savior jesus christ again there has been some debate over over the years as to whether this is refers to one person or two uh so there there are generally well there are generally three views First of all, and this is really grammatically untenable, that it refers to two people, namely, as, as the translators of, of the authorized appear to have thought, the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. There is the second view, which is that this refers to one person, the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, a, a composite description of the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly, great God and our Savior, they do refer to the, the one person. There is a third view that you'll find in some of the commentaries, which would read the verse like this, looking uh, for the glorious appearing, look, sorry, looking for the appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior, even Jesus Christ, which, which links Jesus Christ with the glory. Now, I know the rules say that you're supposed to finish with the view that you think is correct, but I haven't done that this time. I'm very happy with the middle view that we have a single a description here of a single person and that it applies to the Lord Jesus Christ, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I think the context will bear that out because in the verses that follow, we will find the apostle speaking about Christ doing things. And he's drawing on Old Testament scripture where these things, these actions are described as being performed by Jehovah himself. And so I'm very happy to, to see here in this verse, this, this great, perhaps one of the, the most overt declarations in Scripture of the truth that we all hold so dear. And our Lord Jesus Christ, he is God, a very God. We're glad of that. And we are looking, not so much for his glorious appearing, we are looking for the appearing of his glory. In the darkness of a November night, in a world that has, seems to have gone so very badly wrong, my brother, my sister, what will it be when we see the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ? What will it be? How much we should long, how much we should be looking for this, this glorious appearing. And he's described in verse 14 as the one who gave himself for us. And, and there are these Old Testament allusions to Psalm 129 and to Ezekiel 36 and 37. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And you'll have heard all the jokes about peculiar people. And boy, are we ever. But really the expression just means a people for his own possession. You see, this is the... This is the great motivation for the whole of the chapter. 
Why should a, a, an aged man be sober, grave, tempered, and so on? Why should an aged woman be uh, marked by a, a priestly demeanor? Why should the, the young women be carrying out these seven things that society would really set at very little value? And why are all these things important? These servants, why should they be obedient to their masters who are, who are, who are mean and, and nasty? Why does it matter? It matters, my brother, my sister, because these things become sound doctrine. It matters that the word of God be not blasphemed. It matters so that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. It matters so that we may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. But above all, it matters because the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ gave himself for us with this purpose in view, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a people for his own special possession. And those people should be zealous of good works. That's another key expression of these pastoral epistles. Good works. The word has a, a, a dated sort of sound about it now, but it's so important. And sometimes we, we don't give the emphasis to good works that we ought to. Oh, there good works we rightly preach are of no value in obtaining salvation. But you read through the pastoral epistles and, and you see this, that they are an expected part of our salvation. And we're never told to do good works. The, 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 the verb that is used is, is always more intense, always more energetic than that. And here we are not grudgingly or half-heartedly. We are to be looking for opportunities, is the idea. We are to be zealous of good works. These things, these things that become sound doctrine. He, he takes us right back to the beginning of the chapter. Titus is to speak. And he's to exhort, and he's to rebuke, and he's to do that with all authority. I wonder if you ever read through the pastoral epistles and think what it would have been like to be Timothy or Titus, and this letter from the apostle hits the doormat. And you open it and you read through it and you're thinking, Paul wants me to do that? And Titus was, was just really a, a, a blow in. He, he, was, he was just there in Crete. He was a young man. And Paul knew his ma man and knew his men, and he knew that he could trust them. Mind you, for those of us who fall into that category, it's rather a challenging thing to think, could, could the apostle have, have trusted me with a task like this? He says, these things you're to speak and to exhort, to exhort and to rebuke with all authority. And then he closes with this exhortation, let no man despise thee. The idea is let no man think around you. It might sound to us like a, an exhortation to Titus to, to carry a big stick and to be have a forceful personality and and to 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 sort of overbear in such a way that no one would dare to stand up to him. That's not the idea at all. It goes back to what we have in verse eight, of verse seven and verse eight. Paul says, "Now, Titus, you are to conduct yourself in your life, and you are to teach in such a way that you give nobody an opportunity to to set your teaching to one side." You see. There's that within all of us. When we hear teaching that, that cuts across us, we would like to dismiss it. And the way that we dismiss it is by dismissing the person that gives us the teaching. And say, well, is he, why should we take any notice of him because? And certainly, when some of us are teaching, it's far too easy for people to, to do that. Wouldn't it be good to be like Titus? That when the, we give teaching from the word of God, people can't wriggle out of it by saying, well, that's only him talking. He says to Titus, let no man despise thee. It's a lovely chapter. We've had to move through it very quickly. But again, I want to just as I close, remind us that these are the things which become sound doctrine. Doctrine matters and behavior matters. And may God grant that we will live with a consciousness that there's a, a watching world, that we are supposed to be unlike them, that we are supposed to be, have a totally different system of values to what they have. No longer the liars and the beasts and the bellies, but to live soberly, righteously and godly, and to live constantly with the awareness that there is one who gave himself for us in order that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a people for his own.